Yeah, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, even if this panel has to compete with the sunny weather and uh, several people are still uh, enjoying the sunlight and uh, refreshments outside, we will start now um, with this uh, panel on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the German Development Institute, Deutsches Institut für Entwicklungspolitik. And um, we thought that um, <clears throat> the title of the panel might reflect an issue which um, our co-host uh, Eadi or our host Eadi is all e also highly interested in. We have chosen a panel from development in the so south to global transformation, what future of our four development studies. Um, my name is Jörg Faust. I'm working at the German Development Institute and I have the pleasure to moderate this panel. Um, as you all know, um, development issues or re issues related to development are uh, uh, becoming more and more important even outside the traditional arena of um, tr development studies. So um, if we talk about global transformation in the environmental arena, if we talk about security studies, governance issues, but also um, about topics of inequality, social inclusion, and poverty, we do see or we do perceive that these topics are not only relevant or uh, for those who have been traditionally studying development issues in developing countries, but um, that those issues um, are climbing up on the agenda of uh, disciplines in the social sciences which um, often have not dedicated themselves as much to uh, the development, uh, developing world as uh, development studies. And what we would like to discuss in this panel uh, is what does this trend mean for uh, development studies and for such organizations as the German Development Institute or EADI. Um, given the fact that um, this panel is on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the DIE, um, just let me briefly say two sentences about uh, the Institute, um, which was founded 50 years ago and originally had the intention to train <coughs> Um, specialists and bureaucrats in the field of development cooperation, but hereafter um, also developed uh, further and today we might say that the German Development Institute is not only <coughs> active in the, feeling, in, in the field of training young professionals, but also very active in research and policy advice. And um, given this background, uh, we thought that um, it is obviously that for us from the German Development Institute, but also from, for you, um, development study experts, and for EADI as an organization, this topic is, is highly relevant. Um, let me now introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, I start with Isa Baut. Uh, you all know Isa. She is the president uh, of EADI and professor at the Faculty of Social, Science, Social and Behavioral Science at the University of Amsterdam. Then we have Jan Berner, professor for economics, uh, for environmental economics at the University of Bonn and member of the Center of Development Research, CEF, also here in Bonn. And <clears throat> To my right, we have uh, Siddhartha Malavarapu, an old friend of DIE who is professor and chairperson for international relations at the South Asian University in Delhi and currently guest researcher at the University of Duisburg and the Keter Hamburger College. And to my far right, I have Dirk Mester, who is the director of the German Development Institute and also teaches political science uh, at the University of Duisburg-Essen. And 
I would like to proceed in the following um, order. I would like to give the panelists the opportunity to give a five minutes introductory statement on uh, a particular issue of their expertise related to the theme of the panel and hereafter give them also the chance to refer to each other's introductory statements before opening up the panel to the broader audience so you all have a chance to to ask our panelists about um, those things you think are relevant when discussing this issue. So Dirk, uh, I would like to start with you and um, your focus of research has been for the last decade, let's say, and even before on global governance and climate change. And at the same time, you're directing such a lar large institute whose thematic focus has traditionally been on developing countries. Now against this background, could you tell us a little bit about <coughs> both of your research topics, so global governance and environmental transformations, from your perspective have influenced the field of development studies during the last decade and perhaps give us some bold arguments where do you see the field in five years from now? Okay, I have five minutes for that. <laughs> so <laughs> no more. So um, I would like uh, to start saying that when the institute has been founded 50 years ago, or institutes like IDS has been founded, development research had very clear boundaries. No, it was about understanding underdevelopment and understanding how non-developed countries, underdeveloped countries, can become at the end of the day OECD countries. So this was the big research program. Then we focused on development policy to, perform, to, to promote this. This has been the basic agenda. And this has been the basic agenda of IDS, my own institute. EADI is linked to this kind of agenda. And uh, I would like to, to argue that bringing new issues in, my major feeling is that the, re the research field development research will transform completely. I think that it will look like completely different in 10 years from now. And I will demonstrate a dynamic which I see from one angle only. This is the climate change and global environmental change perspective because I'm engaged in that. And uh, I would like to demonstrate how this new perspectives and challenges drive the research field into a new direction. For me, the first step when I started to reflect and work on climate change and other global governance issues, the first step was, okay, we need to understand how climate change impact on developing countries. This was still classical development research. The question was, there is a new challenge around climate change and how do this impact developing countries and what can developing countries do to manage this kind of climate change and what can development policy to do to help developing countries to, to, to manage climate change issues. So it was only an additional aspect of the old agenda. This was my first step. The next step which I moved into uh, changed several parameters and I would like to focus on five of those changing parameters which, will, which is shifting development research into a new direction. And my background is that with a team within my institute, I am chairing a scientific advisory board, which is called the Chi Scientific Advisory Board on Global Change. So we do work on global environmental change and how this is impacting countries around the world and global systems around the world. And the first parameter which, sh which shifted uh, completely was disciplines. So in this context, we work about global environmental change, we are working with social scientists and development uh, people like us, researchers like us, with uh, natural scientists understanding the earth system, understanding the climate system, and engineers understanding the technologies which we are then uh, implementing or trying to implement to solve problems. No? And the research agenda in this context to manage global environmental change is at the end of the day we think we have de designed a research agenda arguing that we need to understand the dynamics between three systems. The first system is the Earth system. <laughs> how does this work? And how is it, is it changed by the second system, the social system? And this is about our social sciences. No? The first thing is about natural sciences. And the third system is then technical systems because 
depending technical systems we use, the output of the interaction between Earth system, social systems, and technical systems will be completely different. No? We call this transform transformation theory for sustainability. So it is radically interdisciplinary, bringing in disciplines which I, in development research, have not been working with beforehand. No? The second parameter which has been changing is about methodology. No, in, when you try to work on Earth system changes and how this interact with human systems, with the global economy, with technical systems, the global energy system, for example, or the global land use systems, no, you need to work with different methodologies. In the Global Advisory Council on Global Change, we bring together Earth system analysis with integrated assessment analysis on energy systems, water systems, population <laughs> dynamics, with, let's say, classical analytical tools of development research. These three different methodologies are, bringing, are, are being brought together here, which is new for most of us. It was very new for me. So methodologies are coming in, which we have not been working with before. The third parameter, which is very important, I think, is that from the climate change perspective and global environmental change perspective, the differentiation between OECD countries and developing countries doesn't make sense any longer, no? because we are all developing countries having in mind economies which we need to create, which are zero carbon and very low resource intensive. No? So the light build, the per perspect perspective for developing countries cannot any longer be becoming an OECD country. And what we are looking for is transformation paths towards uh, sustainable development at a global level, and this implies that all our, all our, our economies need to transform radically. You know? So the old north-south -north divide uh, is not working any longer. The fourth param parameter is, and this has to do with global power shifts, which we have been talking about uh, in the morning also, and yesterday already. You know? When we work together with colleagues in India, Sidat, you know? or in China, or in Brazil, when they contact us from a non-development -re research perspective, what they are expecting working with us about development challenges is that they expect that we know how Europe works. Now, because their research on China, India, Brazil is excellent. No, they do, ex do not expect from us to do joint research on Brazil. No? We might support a bit. What they are expecting is when they work about, or work about social system uh, reforms or low carbon transformations, they want and uh, need work and knowledge about what is going on in Europe. <laughs> huh? So it's a different kind of partnerships which we need to build up. If we don't do that, they don't cooperate with us as a research, in a deep development research institute, they go to the Kiel Institute for World Economics. They have the original know-how about economic transformations, maybe even low carbon transformation. We are challenged there. This is my, my, uh, my fourth uh, parameter. And my fifth and last parameter is that Therefore, the institute, and I am, now I'm coming to the institutional level, no? in the field of sustainability research, which we are realizing in the institute, we are cooperating now and competing with completely different partners beyond the classical development research community, which is represented probably here in the room. No? So we are cooperating with uh, sustainability institutions not coming from the development research perspective, the Stockholm Institute for Environmental uh, Research. We work with uh, YASA in Vienna, the Institute for Integrated Assessment Analysis. Well, this, this is much more driven by, by natural scientists and even engineers no, working for, on issues which from a sustainability perspective are very important. We work together with the Fraunhofer Institute, engineers, uh, where people are reflecting on low carbon transformations from an engineering and technological <laughs> perspective. So the partners which we are engaged with now are different from the partners we have been working with before. And this implies that our institute, and this is probably true for many of your institutes also, our institute is moving into research domains where we have not been working in before and the other way around. No? P institute, institutions which have not been engaged in res uh, development research like the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research like the Stockholm Environmental Institute, like the Fraunhofer Institute for Systemic Innovation Research. They are moving into development arenas, working on the Chinas, Indias, Brazil, etc., etc. So the boundaries are being redefined. This is the major message here. No? And therefore, I think that development research will be 
looking very different in the future, we will see around issue areas and problem areas, we will see very new community emerging. And we are seeing this in our institute in this field, but not only in this field, which we have, I have been talking about, sustainable development. It's actually very similar when you move into the team working on international financial markets. Our partners are different now because the North-South divide is not any longer the major separation between our uh, disciplines. What is an economic development economist for in a global economy where Greece and uh, Argentina and the US have very similar problems, actually? Thank you, Dirk, for this uh, uh, perspective on, uh, on a radical change for development studies. Now, moving from the global issue of global environmental change to the local to the local level. I wonder whether you, um, Isa, share those so thoughts about radical transformation. Um, on the one hand, one could imagine that urbanization today is, is one of the major trends affecting not only least but also middle-income countries as well as highly industrialized countries. So the topic of urbanization is also addressed by a range of, of disciplines and many, many, many methods and different theoretical frameworks. So could you tell us in, in how far this multitude of perspectives on urbanization um, potentially leads to a similar radical change or to the uh, erosion perhaps of a core development oriented research question or whether there is a remaining core issue from the perspective of development studies when you study or when we study issues related to um, urbanization. Is that going to work? Thank you. Indeed, when we talk about cities, or I prefer to talk about cities rather than urbanization, because there has been a huge transformation in the study of urban areas and, and urban processes, recognizing that urbanization or that cities are not an agglomeration of populations, but rather that cities are very, bring together in one location very strategic actors who then both uh, define local coalitions in terms of governance and also use resource flows coming into cities and uh, flows going out of those cities. So we should be looking much more at cities and urbanization as hubs in networks. And when one starts to look at that issue of cities as hubs in networks, you start to look at very different issues. The first thing is, of course, as the World Bank report from the early 2000s said, cities are drivers of economic growth. So we need to look very much more at how cities are inserted into their regions and how they influence their regions, both within countries, but also how they are linked to international networks through the global value chains. The second major area, I think, when we talk about urbanization and cities as hubs in, uh, in networks, is that they are the locations, the spaces for new types of social mobilization and governance. As hubs of social mobilization, bringing together uh, new groups, groups perhaps marginalized on the one hand, there's been a great deal of uh, study, for instance, on mobilization of people in substandard settlements, but also the new kind of insurgent citizenship which is being built up through coalitions of actors in cities. These new forms of citizenship start to redefine what happens in terms of local governance and also what kind of strategic coalitions are being made politically between actors at the city level, but also together with strategic political actors at state and national and international level. They also, this, this issue of urbanization also brings together a number of new issues in terms of development studies. You already mentioned environment. If you look at where the location of cities in low, low uh, elevation coastal zones 
bringing together large sections of population and also, say, major portions of a national um, wealth, the issue of environment and how local governments uh, work or deal with environmental risks becomes one not uh, just of numbers, but of very strategic areas uh, of where one needs to look at environmental issues. The third, when we talk about um, governance, this whole idea of local governance cannot only be limited to what happens in city areas. We need to look at what kind of strategic coalitions are made between different scale levels of government internationally, say cross-boundary, as well as uh, vertically within countries. And that means that we need to look at how new social contracts are being built up in these hybrid arrangements. We have to look at the new ways in which, um, in which these, these say that the topics around city development uh, are incorporated into, into the domain of development studies. I'm thinking, you already mentioned climate, climate issues, but I'm thinking also, for instance, of disaster management, security studies, and for instance, uh, legal frameworks that uh, also inform urban development. This means rather than suggesting that as uh, international development studies we have a core, a remaining core function, I would suggest rather that we have an integrative function across these different disciplines who don't talk to each other in principle, but because of the kind of issues that we are faced with in urban development need to talk to each other and need to have a more integrative analytical framework. So I think that's where our strength lies, and certainly the strength of an uh, organization like IADI, in which we cross those disciplinary boundaries. And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. The second thing I would like to say, and that actually follows on from what you were saying, um, about the north-south divide disappearing in terms of analytical frameworks. This is something that uh, is very, um, very strategic for us as development uh, studies scholars. And it's not that easy when you look at what has been done in terms of urban or city network research. If you look at the models that are existing about, for instance, global city networks, those are very much dominated by social science scholars writing about situation in high income countries and looking at the world from the perspective of New York, uh, Frankfurt and Tokyo and hardly even recognizing uh, cities in, in uh, the global south. Jennifer Robinson, and if they do, they see them as locations for experiments, for data gathering, and not for theory forming. And I think that's precisely where we come in because those contexts not only mean that city strategies, city development strategies are quite different and play out differently in the global south, but also that we need to in, inform theory to make it a truly global theory um, by looking at what the theoretical contributions are from cities, city models and city development strategies in the South. That has methodological implications, as you were talking about. And those implications are as follows. We need much more um, a comparative approach. We need a comparative approach, not only across regions, but also across contexts. This morning we had a panel looking at the different realities of capital cities versus regional hubs versus cities in um, larger urban agglomerations in terms of the context setting, the limits and the boundaries of what those city uh, governments can do as strategic actors. We also need to look 
when we make these kind of comparisons in using a much more interpretive analysis, because of course the varieties of contexts are so huge that some of our colleagues will say, well, you can't compare, you can't meaningfully compare. But I think when we, when we use an interpretive, um, in, in interpretive approach in terms of looking at the different coalitions, the different strategic actors, the different domains um, that city development tries to, incor to incorporate in terms of economic growth, in terms of social inequalities, in terms of environmental issues, then we start to build uh, a framework which does allow for that kind of comparison. It does mean a diff very different kind of methodology. It means a building of knowledge which engages, engages with practitioners on the one hand and a variety of practitioners um, right through the whole process of doing the research, not just at the end, not for dissemination, but right from the defining of what the core issues are in urban development and following that through to the end results. It also means that the kind of publication, the knowledge building that is there may be quite different. I can't remember, someone was saying, yeah, these policy makers, will they ever read our reports? No, obviously not. So the kind of lobbying that we have to do is it has to take a very different form, not policy briefs, but actually engaging in political discussions on the ground, um, and mobilizing researchers both locally as well as internationally and working as catalyst in the discussions that happen at the local level. What are the implications for international development studies? On the one hand, um, well, let me put it this way. It means that we need to work in a much more interdisciplinary fashion and design and integrate the frameworks from our different disciplines in such a way that they can actually deal with the problems that we are trying to tackle. The second thing for the next generation of researchers is that where there is a huge interest we find among young scholars, among students, to actually take up this kind of, um, this kind of studies. So that's not the issue. The issue lies in our institutional context with a monodisciplinary um, framework in which the, the IDS is often seen only as an applied studies um, a program where we need to prove ourselves both in terms of the interest that we generate and in terms of the outcomes that we bring. Thank you. Sita, you, you are from, from India now, um, a developing country where development studies have been particularly well established in, in the past. From your perspective as a scholar now of, of, of international relations, do you see that the changing weight of India in the global arena has also had an impact on how development studies are conceived in India? And is this debate we are having here today a typical debate within the realm of a traditional Western research community? Or are there similar discussions taking place in India or other emerging powers? Thanks. Uh, there are really two points of entry in terms of thinking about uh, the question uh, you asked me. Uh, I think one, of course, um, I come from the discipline of international relations, but I'm interested more generally in the question of the politics of knowledge. Uh, what happens when concepts and categories travel from one part of the world to the other? What are the implications of uh, these concepts and categories moving from one space to the other? And how are they, in a sense, sometimes renegotiated or uh, reformulated uh, in some way or the other? And the other issue, of course, I think, is this broader question of disciplines and disciplinary histories. And I think development studies seems to be at a particularly reflexive moment in terms of thinking about its various sort of phases. Um, I think there are three or four concerns which uh, would be important to most scholars of development studies uh, from large parts of the, of the, uh, of the global south. Uh, I think one issue, of course, um, is the sole question of historical continuity. 
Um, and I think while we like to think perhaps that there is a fundamental rupture today that we sort of, we transcend, we need to transcend disciplines, we need to move away from sort of being too locked into one particular, particular orbital of concerns in terms of thinking about the world. Uh, I think still there are issues fundamentally relating to the manner of the constitution of disciplines itself and the trajectories they subsequently follow. Uh, so from that angle, I think it would be interesting to look at the lineage of development studies and to sort of bring in this whole question of historical continuity again. Because fundamentally, I think this whole issue of thinking about the world in terms of power asymmetries and hierarchies um, doesn't, hasn't entirely, in, a, in any sense, disappeared. I think those questions are still relevant and the, the challenge really is how do we pose the question in a manner in which we can now probably uh, answer it in more constructive ways. Uh, I do think that the category of the North and the South also are still relevant uh, in, in many ways. Uh, and there is perhaps a, a need to think again about ways in which we can make this conversation um, a more egalitarian and reasonable conversation in terms of a broad set of concerns. Um, in terms of the field of development studies, I think two pieces of scholarship which I found particularly exciting from the point of view of the developing world uh, are work, uh, works by Uma Kotari and Bina Agarwal. Uh, I think Uma Kotari has a full book called A Radical History of Development Studies, Individual Institutions and Ideologies, uh, which maps out a fascinating intellectual history of the field of development studies. And I think from this sort of uh, uh, engagement, uh, at least three or four concerns seem to be fairly pertinent to scholars, uh, particularly looking at development and the idea of development uh, from a particular vantage point in the Global South. Uh, so I think one, of course, issue which keeps surfacing again is sort of the axes of class, gender, race. Uh, how do these axes, in a sense, intersect with new understandings of development studies? You know, what is the nature of that interface? Um, clearly, uh, none of these categories also are, uh, are sort of osmotically you know, disappeared. They're all still around in some, some form or the other. But how, can, how do they sort of now uh, have a different life in the manner in which development studies understands them today? Uh, the second issue, of course, is to bring international political economy in in a more sort of central and fundamental way. Uh, and here again, I think uh, there is this whole question. I think one of the scholars, Colbridge, talks about the dirty world of policy making, where at some level you can't escape a, a moment of political expediency, where you have to make quick decisions, you have to make a certain sort of, you have to indicate your sort of stance very clearly one way or the other, and it comes with certain implications. So again, from this angle, it's important to think about who is speaking for whom and, and under what conditions. Uh, I think that question still uh, is perhaps an important question on the map of many development studies scholars in, in the developing world. The third issue, of course, uh, is linked to this whole question of the semantics of development studies, so a whole range of buzzwords and concepts around uh, uh, notions like fragile states or uh, you know, participatory development or, you know. Um, so again, here, a sort of a critical point of entry in terms of thinking about the, the sort of the play of these words and what they exactly mean, um, what interest do they represent. I think some of these traditional concerns are, are still, in a sense, going to surface in more ways than one when one looks also at, this, at the sort of um, pieces of scholarship emerging from the developing world. And I think the broader question, the big question of embedding this whole discussion in the larger sort of context of global capitalism. Uh, I mean, Thomas Piketty's book is just out and where he talks about uh, historical wealth and income inequalities, uh, in a sense, uh, <laughs> likely to be sustained over a longer period of time, uh, which is because he argues, I think, among other things, that the rate of returns on capital um, is higher than the growth in income um, in recent years. So, so again, there is this whole question of uh, accumulation and some of the gains of, uh, of that accumulation and how can this sort of be balanced. So I think all these issues in some form or the other are likely to surface in terms of thinking about development studies. Uh, and I think in terms of the sort of discussions, I was interested, when I looked at the map of uh, institutions in India working on development studies, whether it's the Center for Development Studies, the Madras Institute of Development Studies, um, or if you look at uh, other institutions as well, the research and information systems for developing countries, um, I think the development studies institutes don't use the language of global governance. Uh, they're interested in the question of globalization. Uh, and they pose it very often as sort of an issue of uneven globalization and how do we sort of uh, interpret uneven globalization. 
but or they would talk about global economic governance in certain domains. So I think this idea of patchwork governance, in a sense, seems to be more, uh, in a sense, tractable than a broader sort of uh, ecology, a rubric, uh, which uses the term global governance itself. Uh, and I think that seems to be one dimension, which I thought I should uh, sort of also flag. Um, finally, I think uh, uh, there's this uh, darker sides of virtue. David Kennedy makes an argument about uh, human rights advocacy and how human rights advocacy, um, even though it's sort of in done the best intentions, sometimes also runs up against certain issues and problems. And one of the arguments he makes is that it perhaps um, also sort of limits our notion of emancipation or hegemonizes, hegemonizes or monopolizes our notion of emancipation. Uh, and it closes the possibility of other ways of thinking about emancipation. So I think this sort of set of questions perhaps could also be asked uh, in a more pointed fashion to development studies uh, professionals in a more critical sort of vein to think about uh, how we can think about the broader issue of development studies uh, in that light. So on the whole, I think it's a world of very interesting possibilities, but I think uh, there are also a set of traditional concerns which are not going to disappear very soon. Uh, we'll have to contend with them and find ways of constructively engaging them. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Jan Bernard, uh, to take up the issue of historical continuity, I mean, um, in, in development studies, uh, interdisciplinary approaches are generally praised. Yeah? But at the same time, there are strong career incentives in many of the core disciplines of the social sciences to focus on a rather narrow disciplinary uh, research path, which is good then for your individual career as a researcher. Now your research topic is also um, sustainable forest management in developing countries. Um, could you tell us from your perspective uh, um, and from your experience in how far a multidisciplinary research perspective on, on your issue, on this issue, is really increasingly valued and appreciated by the core disciplines involved in this research issues, or whether there are still so many epistemological, theoretical, methodological differences between those different disciplines, which, which create an, an important barrier for, for approaching such topics in a more integrated way. Okay, um, I think I'd like to take a step before I actually answer your question, and ask the question, um, when is interdisciplinarity actually useful and beneficial uh, for something? And I think it depends very much on the question that you're posing. And uh, I will talk about it in my context of, of tropical forest conservation or sustainable development at the tropical forest margins. And uh, there are two types of very different questions. And the first question is, uh, I think, very much related to what Dirk Messner has called the, the Earth system. Uh, earth system research. Um, one key question, for example, that people are uh, keen to do research uh, on in these days is uh, what is the role of forests in regulating re regional climate? Um, when you cut it down, does it mean that you have less rain or more rain uh, downstream or whatever? And there's no way around you have you having a, a very hardcore team of hydrologists, uh, vegetation ecologists and, and modelers to figure out um, whether uh, there is an effect or not and what, how large the effect is and all that. So this is a very disciplinary research question that requires very deep disciplinary research. Now when it comes to asking questions uh, like what does that mean for people and farmers and what kind of policies do we need to adapt uh, or to mitigate changes that are related to um, deforestation and consequently climate change, um, then you come to uh, a different world of questions that relate to the social system or the economic system and the technical system and how they interact with the earth system. Um, and that's where interdisciplinary actually becomes um, interesting. I think both have their justification, both are needed. Now, then the sec next second question is, uh, what kind of interdisciplinary approaches do we have to deal with these interrelationships between the three systems? And um, I think there are two fundamentally different approaches and which again both are needed. And I, I would term the first one um, sort of a, a combination of disciplinary work and is interdisciplinary th synthesis. So if you look at what the work that have been done on tropical forests, 
um, in, in broad terms, um, you often find uh, a lot of very hardcore discipline, disciplinary work that is then synthesized by people who, who actually do s something that I would call rather uh, uh, interdisciplinary thinking than research. So no one uh, who's interested in land use change and, and conservation gets around reading Eric Lambin or Susanna Hecht. Yeah? Um, so it's, uh, as, um, interestingly, uh, it's often the geographers who kind of have this universalist approach of bringing together uh, findings from disciplinary areas into a coherent uh, set of frameworks or, or conceptual ideas or even policy recommendations. Um, the second type of, of interdisciplinary research is the research that we probably are talking about here, which is integrating uh, across, across disciplines, methods, approaches, data collection, protocols, and all that. And that's uh, the hard part, um, actually. And uh, there are some preconditions for that, that to take place. And uh, usually there are all these barriers, um, people not being able to understand each other. Um, but uh, my experience has been when there is an incentive to collaborate, then uh, you actually always find someone who's interested in your discipline uh, and a group of people who are willing to go through the transaction costs of sitting together trying to understand each other. Um, and uh, of course, one, one of the key barriers is, uh, is uh, language, terminology, and uh, um, working routines. So when I did my, started my first job as a postdoc economist in a group of an ecologist and a mathematician, the first question I, I got at the first day was, uh, what, you're working with real numbers? Uh, we just make them up. It's enough to show the principles. Yeah? Uh, so this is what you have to, the learning process you have to go through. And we have this at, at ZEF the whole time. We have three departments, a political science department, an you know, economics department, and an ecology department. And uh, we're having these conversations all the time. The political scientists think the economists are too simplistic. The economists think the political scientists don't come up with hard numbers. And we have to find a way to get through it. But if there's an incentive, we sit together and write a proposal together that's interdisciplinary. So there are ways to manage the process. My last point um, is uh, about what we can expect from interdisciplinary research and maybe also research in general. And I think there's a somehow dangerous tendency um, uh, by donors, the general public, and the policymakers to expect that research can actually bring about very big changes in very uh, few, few uh, time spans. Yeah? So I've been working for six years in the uh, consultative group of international agricultural research organizations, and they have recently gone through a reform, um, and they were forced to, to, to create some sort of so-called consortium research programs that are cross-cutting across topics, across centers. And uh, they were also forced to put in impact goals that were like, we're gonna conserve 90 million hectares of forest until 2017. We're gonna lift so and so many million people out of poverty in the next decade. No? There's no way that science and research can bring about such impacts in such short, short, short time spans. So I think um, we, we have a, a responsibility here. Of course, everything is changing. We have to adapt to changes, but we also have a responsibility to make clear what research can do and what research cannot do. And uh, unless we uh, start um, thinking about that and stop competing against each other uh, by putting in proposals that have unrealistic goals, we're going to shoot ourselves in our, in our own foot. Because at some point, someone will, evalu will evaluate us and ask us, uh, well, where are the 90 million people lifted out of poverty? Uh, apart from the fact that it's hard to measure whether it was science or something else. But uh, in, in my experience, the, the pathways through which science and interdisciplinary science has an effect on what's happening on the ground are much more diffuse and, and they have to do with uh, uh, human, human capital moving through systems and people who did their PhD now working as policy makers and administrations 10 or 15 years after the projects have, have finished. Um, uh, and this is the kind of impact that I think we have to do a better job in, in showing um, and then maybe also become clearer when we should opt for a more interdisciplinary or more disciplinary or more synthesis way of doing things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I now have the, or you now have to, the opportunity to um, shortly refer perhaps or to contradict each other or to <laughs> engage in a discussion before I open up to the broader audience and um, um, <coughs> unfortunately Sidat has to leave a little bit earlier to catch a to catch a flight so 
Uh, thank you very much for, for, for being with us here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Dirk. Dirk. Yeah, I wanted to catch up on uh, what Isa has been arguing regarding the new design of development research, next steps, our strengths and weaknesses, and, and one or two sentences on interdisciplinarity. Uh, regarding the, the future of the discipline, no? development research, I would argue that there are three options, and I see only one of those as, as realistic. No? Uh, the first option would be we stay with the old questions, which we started with 50 years ago. No? Poverty, poorest countries on earth, uh, what makes them completely different? And we know that probably with the know-how of uh, economists and political scientists, able to interpret dynamics in what you said, New York, Frankfurt, and Tokyo will not understand these very poor countries and their internal dynamics. So this was a starting point. No? So focusing on these shrinking group of countries, this is one option. No? Um, the second option is, as we move into our, our, our living in the era of globalization, let's move from development research to global development research. Um, and I would be very skeptical. No? And when, when I listen around what we have been saying, I mean, we could argue that, okay, we work on any development issue in any country, no? because the North-South div divide disappeared. So we work on 109, uh, 193 societies and countries in every country. Not only we work on 193 countries, we also work on any sector. No? It's health, it's climate, it's energy, it's the economy, it's everything. It's global development. No? And even further, we work on very different levels. We are focusing on local levels of all these countries, on national levels of all these countries, and on global dynamics at the same time. And not even that. Any discipline is welcome. <laughs> because we work with economists, behavioral scientists, uh, urbanists, geographers, evolutionary biologists, whatever comes in and can tell us something about human development in a global context. This is not a discipline. This, is, uh, this does not have any boundary. No? So this is not the future of development research. So what, what I see, and this is the third uh, path then, is that around certain problem arenas, which will pop up and which we are developing, new kinds of development of, of uh, research communities uh, will emerge. No? Um, Isa, you talked about the urbanization issue. No? Um, there, there is already a community which goes far beyond classical development research working on these kind of areas. No? And so this kind of differentiation will take place around the question of planetary boundaries and wealth creation a new community of earth system change researchers, global change researchers, and development researchers are coming together. No? So my picture is that this kind of differentiation will take place because global development research without boundaries does not make any sense. No? We lose our strength, in, would lose our strength in this process. Last sentence, interdisciplinarity. Um, um, regarding what, what Jan, what, what you argued uh, about no, and th thought about. Um, I think that there are two, two, two types of interdisciplinarity and you mentioned that. The first type of interdisciplinarity is, uh, let's say, the, the, the thin, uh, thin interdisciplinarity is that we need to understand each other. No? And, and this is important in many fields. So uh, I need to understand the climate impact research to work on adaptation strategies. I do not need to make uh, research together with them, but I need to understand their results. No? So this is uh, thin interdisciplinarity. And then thick th interdisciplinarity implies that we really work together and we need to bring our methodologies together. In many fields, I think this is absolutely unavoidable. We need to move into this direction. I, I have been working in one team uh, trying to understand the potential of bioenergy and the, its contribution to the global energy system. You can't do this kind of research not interacting with the engineers, talking about it, having in mind the technologies and understanding what, what they can realize in technological terms and without working with the uh, global land use natural scientists and the social scientists in the, at the same time. This is synergy. No? And we, in the, at least in the German context, are not well trained to do that. My feeling is that 
Rafi, I'm looking to you, uh, the UK. You know, in the UK, this kind of interdisciplinarity is something which is existing in parallel to the classical disciplines. It is like an additional discipline, being, being, um, being teached at the beginning or since the beginning, becoming a scholar in interdisciplinarity. No? In the German setting and in many other uh, uh, national contexts, this is different. No? In our context, to become uh, someone who can move into the interdisciplinary field implies that first you make, have to make a huge career <coughs> in your discipline. Afterwards, you can become interdisciplinary. No? So maybe. But in the others, other fields, it's this way. And this implies we, we, you, we lose a, a lot of time for training young people to move into thick interdisciplinarity. No? Thank you. Isa, you want to comment? I agree with you. We should not become so diversified and fragmented that we don't, that we lose sight of what we're actually trying to do. Um, and I think in our discussions in the past day and a half, we've already identified some of the key issues that we, uh, that define our, um, our being uh, development studies scholars. Uh, and, hmm? or, identity. or identity, that's the word. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Um, and I think some of those have come up very, very clearly. However, that we talked about, Rafi ended his lecture by asking who is orchestrating the way that economic development and growth is taking place at the moment. Luca asked or stated there are strategic global actors who are in the background whom we uh, yeah, with whom we need to deal because they are actually setting the agenda and the regulatory framework. So I think it's these kind of major questions which don't only play out at the global level but also have their ramifications uh, at national and local levels. Those are the questions that, that bind us as epistemic community. Having said that, we need to deal with a context in which that recognition is not always there or I could say is quite often not there. That is, and I, I'll, I'll take an example. The Dutch government at a certain point, well, they didn't commission this. Was, this was the, the, yeah, what we call the WRR, the Council on uh, Research and, and Policy. And they wrote a report on development research. And basically they said, Forget social policy. We've done a lot of that. It's not relevant. It's not useful. Forget it. We need to concentrate on economic growth, on, de on dealing with poverty as part of that, but mainly through economic growth. And we need to deal, um, if I remember correctly, just off the top of my head, with environmental issues. And that's it. That report actually influenced the, the, the thinking of the ministry to such an extent that they withdrew a great deal of funding from what was then available in terms of a variety of disciplines uh, bundled under Votro uh, uh, for, for development research. That was reconfigured into those areas, those policy defined areas that our government finds useful, the top sectors water, food, uh, transportation. So very much, say, end of pipe definitions of what we should be doing in terms of research. The funding for research goes through that way and is defined by those priorities, which means, and, and the second pro set of priority is which countries were only allowed to do research in those countries where there is a development cooperation relationship. Now, you can imagine the implications for the kind of research, comparative, interdisciplinary, historical research that we are proposing. That is a context which actually bypasses that kind of perspective totally. So, that way of defining the knowledge agenda is not solely by us, it's very much by um, the political context with which we need to continuously engage to put forward our views and to reset the agendas for research. So in that sense, I think we need a very, uh, we need to have a strategic focus 
on, engage, on, on the validation of the knowledge that we produce and what kind of validations we find acceptable. We need to look very clearly at the interfaces in terms of um, policy practitioners and researchers to help set the agenda, both in terms of thinking as well as in terms of substance, and also to uh, look at the regulatory frameworks behind these interfaces. Thank you. Um, what I find particularly interesting is in, in, in this discussion is um, a discussion we also have in, in our institute is that on the one hand we do perceive the danger of kind of an overstretch, uh, overstretching the boundaries uh, of development studies in the future, um, as, as you have mentioned it. But on the other hand, uh, we also face the difficulty to focus given this broad area of, of, of relevant topics and um, also the broad area of expertise and specialists in different social disciplines, it is quite difficult in an environment of scientific debate to really focus on some of the core issues which will be relevant in the future of, of, of development studies. Um, but before um, giving you a final opportunity to, um, um, for some final remarks, I would at least take one point in time here to open up to the audience and ask, ask you if you have um, precise and short and statements or questions. Um, I can take about two or three questions. So one, two, three, and four. Would you please use the mic there, yeah? I guess you have to switch. Yeah. Maybe you can speak up loud. Thank you. Um, Please. Yeah, my question is not so much the scope of uh, the discussion that Dave Messner has stated. Could we imagine another role for the Development Institute, Research Institute, which would be to, to better advise our national politicians that are lacking an understanding of the real world as it is? We know that politics today are very rooted in national and local context, mm -hmm. while their decision, increasingly, we all know that, request to take into consideration the reality of a complex world. So it's not perhaps to go for all the thematics, but at least to refocus not so much on the scope, but on the role, which would be to advise better our northern, in that case, based on the partnership that you 
uh, mentioned with uh, Indian researchers, Brazilian universities, and to advise better our decision maker here. Please. There's a microphone. Oh, great. Well, okay. So uh, uh, the, the um, tendency at the German universities is very much against development studies. And uh, we are people are not considering it as a discipline. Uh, maybe, and they invent all kinds of uh, uh, sexy new, new titles for curricula or masters globalization studies and intercultural something and so on. For us, that has been a problem, but uh, I think uh, in, in Bielefeld it's still okay, but in other universities, the post-colonial critique of development is very heavy in, in the student uh, community and in, in, the, in the staff. Um, the other thing is, um, how, how to overcome it. I know development is an important uh, uh, concept and in the developing world it's still necessary, people want to, to uh, use it as a concept, uh, but uh, somehow we have to come out and all, all of you who have uh, described what they are doing or what they are doing research about, it's much more general research. Okay. Isa, you even said that over it is much beyond development research in, in city research and so on. And of course Thank the, the climate thing anyhow, but how, how to go there? And in, in Germany, I think it's a pity. We have development institutes, okay, but the critique towards universities and the contact between development uh, um, institutions and, and the ministry and also the foreign ministry is not as good as in other countries. Okay, thank you. There was one final, no, it has the, he or she has the, ah, here in the front, sorry. Um, could you pass the microphone to the lady in the front? Uh, Sheila Page, obviously Development Institute and a uh, long time member of AADI, so I, I say this with some hesitation. I would much prefer to think about the study of development rather than talking about development studies, because I've certainly never done development studies. I'm an economist. If I weren't working on development, I would be working on international trade someplace else. But I think that what we are studying, and what we ought to be studying in AID, is the process of development, the problems of development, how development happens, the implications of other disciplines, other phenomena like climate change for development, the implications of development for that. Now that does, that can be disciplinary or interdisciplinary or mixed disciplinary, as, as you were pointing out. But I think we must be quite focused that that is our topic. Yes, we will overlap with people doing uh, climate change someplace else, and that's fine. We will overlap with people doing international trade someplace else, but that's fine. They will be increasingly so because as we heard this morning with the presentation, you can't now talk about world distribution of income without talking about the developing countries. 40 years ago, you could have done. So I think that we will have more people on our patch, but on the other hand, we will be on the patch of more people. But I think that the focus has to be on the process of development, the problems of development, and that and by whatever discipline we consider appropriate. So my focus would be on the subject rather than on the method. Thank you. So, unfortunately, our time is almost over. So. Um, <clears throat> each of you three panelists now has exactly one, one minute or maximum one minute and 30, not only to respond to those questions, but also to make a final statement and preferably a bold statement about the future of development studies. So then 
if we meet here in about 10 years uh, to come to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the German Development Institute, we then might you have you here again on the on the panel to test whether whether your bold statements have become reality or not. Isa, would you like to start? Yeah, yes. Um, that will also be the 50th anniversary of Ayadi, so I look forward to that. Um, I think I very much agree with you, Sheila. It is indeed the study of processes of development. And as Jennifer Robinson has said about cities, these are ordinary cities. Whether they are in the north or the south, they have their own development processes. And that is indeed what we need to do. However, we do need to keep that more interregional comparative perspective because it is not there with our colleagues. My colleagues working on, uh, on the Netherlands, on Amsterdam, think they're, they're making universal theory, with all due respect for my colleagues. That's not the case. And it's that kind of... Uh, yeah, how should I say, biased perspective, uh, a, a dominant, still for the moment, north perspective, if you like, that we need to counter. And that should inform our research. I'll leave it at that. Uh, again, the, the center I'm working for is called Center for Development Research. And it's uh, part of university. So, uh, and I agree with you that there are some university institutes that um, look at us sort of with an what is this kind of beast doing there uh, uh, kind of look. But um, when it comes to uh, profitable collaborations, they are always on board. So uh, I think uh, uh, there's a way to overcome this divide, even, even in, in a country like Germany. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is uh, at our center, we have over the last two years had a very um, time-consuming and uh, uh, hard process trying to define what we mean by development and uh, to put a like, nice mission, mission statement on our website. And we weren't able to come up uh, with, a, with a definition. Um, and at our last uh, re staff retreat, someone said, why do we have to have a definition? Um, why can't we just say uh, we are studying a process that is changing all the time um, uh, some dimensions becoming more important than others. Um, we, we shouldn't be defining ourselves as being uh, liaised with some specific discipline because in 10 years from now, um, by definition of development, we might not be anymore. Um, so we decided not to have a definition um, for our three departments um, uh, because we all have so different views on what it is and we probably remain uh, uh, center in development, doing research on development, and maybe that's fine. You have a mission statement. Um, we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> in ten years' time. You know? ten years ago. Yeah. Missions are so, changing as well. Yeah. Dick. Um, three points, but very brief. D uh, Sheila, development does not help me because uh, the definition issue. You know, for me, development is our dynamics in human, human societies, and this is about everything. So uh, this is a question regarding the boundaries. The development starting point is not helpful for me. My second point, um, it might be helpful to see that we are not the only ones having identity problems. You know, when I uh, work with people from security studies, uh, they do have similar problems the other way around because they are understanding that security issues very often are based on uh, different dynamics in societies and based on development risks and challenges. So research in security studies is being linked with development research. You know? Or when I talk with people from global change research, they are fantastic in modeling global land use changes and calculating how much we need to reduce emissions by 98%, uh, but then asking themselves, oh my God, how could we do that? No? So trying to work together with people understanding development dynamics. So we are not the only ones looking for new allies. This is what I want to say. No? But uh, we cannot, the identical identity problem is still not solved. Now my, th my third point, I mean, 
Rafi, Sheila and Luca. No? I, 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 I suppose that you have been calling yourselves or labeling yourselves development economists. No, no, no you have not. Okay, good. So you, have, you, are, you are a pioneer, Sheila. You, have, you are a pioneer. Because my suggestion is that, uh, Rafi, if you are, uh, have been defining yourself as a, um, a development economist, working in the EAD context and all these kind of, of uh, communities, as you has been based for such a long period at IDS, no? um, I would say that let's move into arenas where our kind of specific areas are also being uh, researched. No? So you are working now with people doing research, Rafi, on inequality issues uh, from any perspective, uh, um, far away from development communities. No? And you as a trade economist uh, have been doing this probably already for a long period of time. So what I would like to argue for is that I would not like to see us only moving within our development research community. No? Uh, we, we should work within the area we are focusing on. We should work with our development research colleagues, which we have been uh, interacting with for a long period of time, but going out and working with any, anyone in the disciplines having answers to the kind of questions which we are asking. No? And doing so, I'm sure that development research will be transformed and our research institutes also will be transformed because the old model was that it was, a, it was a, not a closed, but it was a well, very well-defined research community. No? And this is moving now into certain dire several directions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, unfortunately, our, our time is 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 over um, what I've learned is that probably development studies has been conceived in the past uh, and now as a, as a field with multiple identities um, but which might be nevertheless in in a state of um, identity crisis or in search of new identity um, because of the global transformation what I found particularly helpful was your last comment that development studies is not the only research field which is currently affected by those global transformation and looks for its its own or its appropriate let's say name it appropriate boundaries and what I hope is that this um, small panel here uh, has has helped a little bit in, it, in advancing our deliberation process on how to define um, development studies in the future has, um, has had some thought-provoking ideas about, about what will be the future of development studies and particularly uh, on how, which, which kind of core fields and which kind of um, boundaries have to emerge in order to um, to 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 um, realize the potential of the field and um, to con continue to make development studies as a relevant um, uh, research area in the social sciences. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, thank you very much to you for you um, for listening to the panelists, and I uh, wish you all a very fruitful and thought-provoking. Uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you.